Greetings, friends. I want to welcome you to part two of the future dispensational delusion. And in part one, we, uh, well, actually, the whole series of videos in context of this is dealing with um, the Protestant reformer Henry Gretton Guinness in his book, Romanism and the Reformation. We are specifically reading lecture five. And in lecture five, <clears throat> What uh, what is basically discussed about is the um, historical evidence of the church um, and their standpoint of prophecy regarding the Antichrist and also regarding the distinction between futurism and historicism. Henry Grattan Guinness makes the claim, and obviously through numerous documentations within this lecture that the early church were historicists in um, historicists in writing <clears throat> that they didn't agree to the doctrine of futurism regarding a one-man antichrist that's going to come to power in the last three and a half years of this history of earth's history um, also, what that does is also it, it denotes the rapture because without the rapture, there is no Antichrist because the rapture has to happen and then the Antichrist will arise. So what we did in section one of lecture five is we went through what the early church fathers in apostolic times taught. Again, again we're going through all of the centuries brief overview of all the centuries prior to the Reformation because again we know what the reformers believed they were all unanimous in declaring that the Antichrist the man of sin the son of perdition the little horn has been revealed and is being revealed and will be revealed um, as the biblical historical and prophetic Antichrist okay um, and uh, and obviously throughout the last 150 years there's been a change of emphasis of that uh, basically to the point where you know the Antichrist is no longer the papacy it's someone that's going to come in the future you know so and so therefore the churches today no longer believe that um, the doctrines that um, founded their faith today, which is the Reformation, the doctrines from the Reformation and stuff like that, which again was unanimously agreed upon. So we're going to um, read in section two, starting at the very end of page 202. And it goes as follows, states as follows. Uh, number two, we come now in the second place, very briefly, to review the history of prophetic interpretation in the interval extending between the fall of the Western Empire of Rome and the development of the papal theocracy in the 11th century under Gregory VII. The interpreters of this period belonged, like the fathers, to the historic school. Okay, they were historicists. They did not believe in this futurist doctrine. They interpreted the apocalypse as a prophecy of the whole course of events from the first advent to the consummation, meaning the second coming of Christ. The following authors living in this interval wrote commentaries on the entire apocalypse. Primacius, the Venerable Bede, Alspert, Hamo, Andreas, Erythrus, and Berengad. Primacius, who lived in the middle of the 6th century, interpreted the 144,000 sealed persons in the Apocalypse as the Christian Church. He held that Antichrist would substitute himself for Christ and, blasph and blasphemously assume his dignity, and that the Seven Hill City was Rome. The Venerable Bede, who lived in the north of England at the close of the 7th century, was an historical interpreter of the Apocalypse. Here is a copy of his commentary. He takes the first seal to represent the triumphs of the primitive church. 
He expounds the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13 as a pseudo-Christian false prophet. This is what the this was at the end of the seventh century. Now, okay, let me repeat that one. He expounds the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13 as a pseudo-Christian false prophet. That's very interesting, especially when we come to the aspect of the United States. <clears throat> Ambrose Alspert wrote a wrote a copious commentary on the apocalypse in the middle of the eighth century. He expounds the second beast of Revelation thirteen as meaning the preachers and ministers of Antichrist and teaches that Antichrist will be pro Christo or in Christ's place. It is a remarkable fact that he expounds a grievous sore or ulcer poured out under the first vial as meaning infidelity this is a general view at the present day among historical interpreters they consider the infidelity of the French Revolution to be the fulfillment of this vial Hamel's commentary written in the 9th century is for the most part a bride from Alspert um, now back up to that last portion um, that is uh, I don't think that's a matter of dogmatic things regarding the first vial um, personally I think the the seven last plagues are still to come okay um, I believe that there are hints that there are definitely hints of that vial throughout history but obviously it was not a fulfillment of that vial one can take into consideration a black plague okay um, I think that that was a possible hint of the uh, first vial of Grievous Sores. But uh, regardless, um, uh, goes on as follows. Hamel's commentary written in the 9th century is for the most part abridged from, Als from Onspert. <clears throat> Andreas, who was Bishop of Caesarea, states definitely that the Apocalypse was a prophecy of the thing to happen from Christ's first coming to the consummation. He interprets 144,000 as meaning true Christians and Antichrist would be a Roman king and pseudo-Christ or false Christ. Erythrus, who wrote in the 9th century, mainly follows Andreas. Baron God's commentary on the apocalypse written in the same century is the least satisfactory of all he was a benedictine monk and lived at a very dark period his notion was that antichrist would be an avowed infidel and an open advocate of licentiousness he was as far as is known the first interpreter to propound this view okay so maybe there was little hints of a futurist <coughs> um seed planting with this individual here maybe just a little bit the interval during which these interpreters lived was marked by the steady rise but not by the full manifestation of the papacy two notions contributed powerfully to prevent their recognizing in the imperfectly developed papacy the predicted man of sin they imagined that as the Eastern Empire of Rome seated at Constantinople still continued the let or hindrance to the manifestation of Antichrist remained, completely overlooking the fact that the anti-Christian power foretold in prophecy is definitely linked with the seven hills of Rome, and thus with the fall of the Western Empire and the apostasy of the Latin or Western Church. Okay, so let me re repeat that. That this was this little issue here. You know, in the middle. In the middle part of the of the eleventh century or the tenth century, if you will, through the eleventh century was a misunderstanding of prophecy, and what happened was they believed that since the Eastern Empire was still in power, you know, Or the, or as it says, they imagine that as the Eastern Empire of Rome, seated at Constantinople, still continued, the let or hindrance to the manifestation of Antichrist remained.
But what they failed to realize, what, as, as what it says, is they overlooked the fact that this Antichrist power that was foretold in prophecy is definitely linked with the seven hills of Rome. It has no bounds with the Eastern Roman Empire, and thus with the fall of the Western Empire and the apostasy of the Latin or Western Church is when Antichrist would be revealed. So this right here could be a benchmark, could be what happens when we kind of forget as what has happened today, is we have forgotten history. <clears throat> Goes on as follows, then they spiritualized and explained away a great deal of prophecy. And suppose that they were living in the millennium, and that the Antichrist would not be manifested until the brief outbreak of evil at its close. There is basically the first initial seed of futurism. And also, if you've heard of the Kingdom Now doctrine, this was their downfall. As it states, this false notion had fatal consequences. While these interpreters, in common with the generality of Christians at their period, were looking for the advent of the man of sin in the distant future, he stole unperceived into their midst and usurped the place of Christ over his unwatchful flock. They were not paying attention. Before we leave this medieval period, there are three re remarkable testimonies to which we must refer. We must just refer. Gregory the Great, in the 6th century, declared before Christendom that whosoever... Now, this could be... <laughs> um... Gregory the Great, in the 6th century, declared before Christendom that whosoever called himself universal bishop or universal priest was the precursor of Antichrist. In this, he was doubtless perfectly correct. <laughs> Maybe that was just by a spark of, <laughs> of a divine aspect because of the unwatchful flock that uh, these early, these early uh, believers had. And the aspect that, well, since the Eastern Empire was still around, the let or the hindrance was still in existence, and therefore the Antichrist could not be a current power. And so they basically spiritualized all the prophecies, like, you know, we're now in the millennium, and these types of things, okay? But here comes Gregory the Great, or Hildebrand, <laughs> A pope himself and he comes out and says he probably doesn't realize what he said or maybe he did I don't know um, says that before Christendom that whosoever called himself universal bishop or universal priest was the precursor of Antichrist now when Boniface the third shortly after the death of Gregory took this title in the year 607 he became the precursor of Antichrist, as fully revealed under Boniface VIII. Gerbert of Rheims, before the year 1000, said of the Pope sitting on his lofty throne in gold and purple, that if destitute of charity, he was Antichrist, sitting in the temple of God. In the year 1000. Lastly, Berenger, in the 11th century, referring to the Pope's enforcement at that time of the doctrines of transubstantiation, Affirm the Roman seat to be not the apostolic seat, but the seat of Satan. Thus gradually did an, did an understanding of the true character of the papacy dawn upon the Christian church of this period. We're going to go to part three here, and we're going to read, uh, and it is now, we will now, in the third and last place, Briefly consider the history of prophetic interpretation from the time of Gregory the Seventh in the 11th century to the Reformation in the 16th century. So a period of 500 years. What did they believe? The pontificate of Gregory the Seventh was the era of the papacy unveiled. 
At this date, the Pope dropped the mask of the shepherd and exchanged the crook for the scepter and the sword. The uh, ascension, the accession of Gregory the Seventh in 1073, is a great landmark in the Church's history. Gregory the Seventh, or Hildebrand, as he was called, created, as we have before stated, the papal theocracy. Do you know what this means? He claimed for himself, in the name of God, absolute and unlimited dominion over all the states of Christendom as successor of St. Peter and vicar of Christ upon earth. So the same Gregory the Seventh, <laughs> who stated um, that whoever declared themselves universal bishop or universal priest was a precursor of Antichrist, comes right out and claimed for himself in the name of God absolute and unlimited dominion over all the states of Christendom as successor of St. Peter and vicar of Christ upon, upon earth <laughs> again God had his hands in that one because I, I mean I mean personally I mean there's a little bit of a humor in that in the fact that he basically ate his own words the popes who came after him pushed these claims to their utmost extent at the end of the 13th century, they assumed the proud title of Masters of the World. Three names stand out conspicuously in the three middle centuries of this dark period. Gregory VII, Innocent III, and Boniface VIII. The historian of the Middle Ages well says, As Gregory VII appears the most usurping of mankind, till we read the history of Innocent III, so Innocent III, is thrown into the shade by the supreme audacity of Boniface VIII. In those days lived the great Italian poet Dante. He described his age with extraordinary power writing in the 13th century and in Italy. He painted the papacy as the world beheld it then. And what did the world see then? It saw in the papacy the usurping man of sin and in the Church of Rome the Babylon of the Apocalypse. Mark, even the world, saw it. Here are a few lines from Dante's immortal poem on hell, purgatory, and paradise. <clears throat> Quote, Woe to thee, Simon Magus. Okay, now I just want to stop right there. Simon Magus is found in the book of Acts, and he um, thought that he could buy the Holy Spirit. Um, when you really dive into Simon Magus' history, when they, when... Rome, or when the Vatican states that the the papacy is the succession of Saint Peter, and that Simon Peter was the first pope. When you really look into it, it is referred to as Simon Magus, who was basically the first pope. He was basically a bishop of Rome. He was a pra he 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 was a practitioner of Gnostics of the Gnostics, and and um, and the mystics. And these types of things, okay. So um, I think eventually, I think eventually, I might get around to a nice little study on Simon Magus, so we can really see how um, the influence of Simon Magus has affected the Church of Rome today, and how it has affected the Church of Rome for thousands of years, over a thousand years. <laughs> well over a thousand years so I just want to stop right there on that first line <clears throat> woe to thee Simon Magus woe to you his wretched followers who the things of God which should be wedded unto goodness them rapacious as ye are do prostitute for gold and silver your avarice overcast the world with mourning underfoot treading the good and raising bad men up. Of shepherds like to you, the evangelist was where when her who sits upon the waves with kings and filthy whoredom he beheld. She who with seven heads tore at her birth, and from ten horns her proof of glory drew. Long as her spouse and virtue took delight, of gold and silver ye have made your God, differing wherein from the idolater, but that he worshipped one. A hundred ye? Ah, Constantine, to how much ill gave birth. Not thy conver conversion, but that plent plenteous, that plenteous dower. 
which the first wealthy father gained from the from thee. In his poem on paradise, he says, My place, he who usurps on earth, hath made a common sower of puddle and of blood. No purpose was of ours that the keys which were vouchsafed me should for inside serve. Unto the banners that do levy war, on the baptized, nor I for sigil mark set upon sold and lined privileges, which makes me off to bicker and turn red. And shepherds' clothing, greedy wolves below, range wide over all the pastures, arm of God. Who longer, why longer sleepest thou? In the end of his poem on paradise, he refers to the Apostle John as the seer. The seer he died saw all the grievous times of the fair bride, who with the hands, who with a lance and nails was one. You will observe. This is this is very old English, ladies and gentlemen. So this is really. Uh, <laughs> it is kind of. Uh, a tough read sometimes, so bear with me. You will observe that these beautiful and touching words recognize a historical interpretation of the apocalypse. The Apostle John, according to Dante, saw all the grievous times through which the church was destined to pass. And what Dante saw, the Albigenses saw, and the Waldenses, what wonder was there in this? Would not the wonder have been had the saints remain blind to a fulfillment of prophecy so plain and palpable that even the world recognized it? Okay, the world even recognized it. In the sunny south of France and province in Cat Catalonia lived the Albigenses. They were a civilized and highly educated people. Among these people there sprang up an extensive revival of true religion, and one of its natural effects was a bold testimony against the abominations of, of apostate Rome. Here is Sismondi's History of the Albigenses. On page 7 he says of them and of the Vaudois, All agreed in regarding the Church of Rome as having absolutely perverted Christianity, and in maintaining that it was she who was designated in the Apocalypse by the name of the Whore of Babylon. Rome could not endure this testimony. She drew her deadly sword and waged war against those who bore it. In the year 1208, the Albigenses were murderously persecuted. Innocent III, what a mockery his name, employed the Crusaders in this dreadful work. The war of extermination was denominated sacred. The Pope's soldiers prosecuted it with pious ardor. Men, women, and children were all precipitated into the flames. Whole cities were burned. In Besiers, every soul was massacred. 7,000 dead bodies were counted in a single church. Where the people had taken refuge, the whole country was laid waste. An entire people was slaughtered, and the eloquent witness of these early reformers was, re was reduced to the silence of the sepulcher. Thus began the tremendous war against the saints foretold in Daniel and the Apocalypse, and thenceforward it was, murder, it, was, it was murderously persecuted from century to century. Early in the 13th century was founded the Inquisition, and full persecuting powers entrusted by the Pope to the Dominicans. A remnant of the Vaudois escaping from the south of France took refuge in the Alps, where the light of the gospel habit had been preserved from the earliest times. <clears throat> and then uh, Henry Grattan Guinness goes on to explain a little bit of a testimony um, which he states I have visited the Waldensian valleys and will try in a few words to bring them before you you doubtless remember the position of the city of Milan on the plain of Lombardy Lombardy from the top of the famous cathedral of Milan there is a magnificent view of the southern Alps the plains of Lombardy and Piedmont extend to their base. The Alps are seen stretching to the east and west, as far as the eye can reach. The sun at noon falls full upon their crowded peaks. There they stand in rugged, wild sublimity, their lower slopes mantled with dark forests, their summits crowned with glaciers and eternal snows. To the west among these, beyond the city of Turin, rises the vast white cone of Mount Visso. Among the mountains at its base lie the Waldensian valleys. 
They are five in number and run up into narrow elevated gorges winding among uh, fur-clad steeps and climbing into the region of the clouds, which hover round the icy alpine peaks. These valleys were the refuge of the, quote, Israel of the Alps. Protestants long before the Reformation, these noble mountaineers res resolutely refused to bow the knee to Baal. They were a faithful remnant of the early church, preserved all through the central ages of, of apostasy. This folio volume is a faithful history of the Waldenses written 217 years ago by the Waldensian pastor Leger. It contains his portrait. I have often looked at it with interest. The countenance is scarred with suffering, but full of spiritual light. Leger tells with simple clearness the story of the Waldenses from the earliest times, quoting from ancient and authentic documents. He gives in full their confession of faith and narrates the history of their martyrdoms, including the dreadful massacre in the Vale of Lucerna in 1655, of which he himself was an eyewitness. This book was written only 14 years after that massacre. It contains numerous depositions concerning it, rendered an oath, and long lists of the names of those who were its victims. It gives also plates depicting the dreadful ways in which they were slaughtered. These plates represent men, women, and children being dismembered, disemboweled, ripped up, run through with swords, impaled on stakes, torn limb from limb, flung from precipices, roasted in flames. They are almost too horrible to look at. And this was only one of a long series of massacres of the Waldenses extending through 600 painful years. Milton wrote of these Protestant sufferers his immortal sonnet. Quote, Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, whose bones lie scattered on the Alpine mountains cold, even them who kept thy truth so pure of old. When all our fathers worship stocks and stones, forget not, in thy book record their groans. Who were thy sheep, and in their ancient fold slain by the bloody, by the bloody Piemontes that rolled, mother with infant down the rocks, their moans, the veils redoubled to the hills, and they to heaven. Their martyred blood and ashes sow. Over all the Italian fields were still doth sway. The triple tyrant that from these may grow. A hundredfold who, having learned thy way, early may fly the Babylonian woe. The persecuted Waldenses were students of prophecy from the oldest times. How did they interpret the prophecies concerning Babylon and the man of sin? Here in this book of Ligers is their first treatise on Antichrist written in the year 1120 or nearly 800 years ago. It is written in a language unfortunately now extinct. Ligers gives a French translation in parallel col columns, here it is at page 71, in simple telling terms that treatise brands the Romish church as the harlot Babylon and the papacy as the man of sin and antichrist. That was the faith and confession of the Waldenses. And then obviously here is the uh, uh, the now extinct language that this is written in. Obviously I cannot interpret it for you. I wish I could. <clears throat> Turn now for a few moments to Bohemia. You remember that it is an extensive province in the northwest of Austria. There a reformation sprang up more than a century before the time of Luther. And was quenched in seas of blood. What gave rise to it? The testimonies of John Hus and Jerome of Prague. What did these men hold as to the Church of Rome and the Papacy? that Rome is Babylon and the papacy the Antichrist. Well, let's go ahead and read it. <clears throat> Witness their testimony quoted by Fox the, mart the Martyrologist. I have stood on the spot in Constance where these men were condemned to death. Rome burned them. Here's a history of the Reformation and Anti-Reformation in Bohemia. 
the Bohemian Brethren avowed the doctrines of John Huss, including his views on the anti-papal prophecies. Rome exterminated the Reformed Bohemians. The story is a dreadful one. So let's go ahead and read it. An Epistle of John Huss unto the people of Prague. The more circumspect ye ought to be for that Antichrist laboreth the more to trouble you. The last judgment is near at hand. Death shall swallow up many. But to the elect children of God, the kingdom of God draweth near. Know ye well, beloved, that Antichrist being stirred up against you deviseth diverse persecutions. <clears throat> A letter of John Huss to the Lord John de Clum. By your letter which I received yesterday, I understand first how the iniquity of the great, of the great strumpet, that is, of the malign, of the malignant congregation, whereof mention is made in the apocalypse, is detected, and shall be more detected, which with which strumped the kings of the earth do commit fornication, fornicating spiritually from Christ, and as is there said, sliding back from the truth and consenting to the lies of Antichrist. Through his seduction, and through fear, or through hope of confederacy, for getting rid of worldly honor. Acts and Monuments, Volume 3, page 499. Letter of John Huss, wherein he comforteth his friends, and willeth them not to be troubled for the condemning of his books, and also declareth the wickedness of the clergy. Master John Huss, in hope, the servant of God, to all the faithful who love him and his statutes, what wisheth the truth and grace of God, Surely even at this day is, an, is the malice, the abomination, and filthiness of Antichrist revealed in the Pope and others of this council. Oh, how acceptable a thing should it be, if time would suffer me to disclose their wicked acts, which are now apparent, that the faithful servants of God might know them. I trust in God that he will send after me those that shall be more valiant, and there are, and there are alive at this day that shall make more manifest the malice of antichrist and shall give their lives to the death for the truth of our lord jesus christ who shall give both to you and me the joys of life everlasting this epistle was written upon saint john's ba saint john baptist day in prison and in cold irons i having this meditation with myself that john was beheaded in his prison and bonds for the word of god <clears throat> In the year 1421, the miseries of the Bohemians greatly increased. Besides the executions of by, draw, by drowning by fire and by the sword, several thousands of the followers of Hus, especially the Taborites of all ranks and both sexes, were thrown down the old mines and pits of Kuttenberg. In one pit were thrown 1,700, in another 1,308, and in a third 1,321 persons. Every year, on the 18th of April, a solemn meeting was held in a chapel built there, in memory of those martyrs until the year 1613 when the mint master Reschowitz endeavored to prevent, yet it continued until the great persecution of 1621. So again, the Bohemian Brethren avowed the doctrines of John Huss, including his views on the anti-papal prophecies. Rome exterminated the reformed Bohemians. The story is a dreadful one. But from their ashes rose new witnesses. From the, persecute, from the persecuted Bohemians sprang the Moravians, who this day are missionaries throughout the world. Turn lastly for a moment to England. Before the Reformation, 500 years ago, God raised up in this country John Wycliffe. Men called him the morning star of the Reformation. He translated the scriptures into the English tongue and waged war against the errors and abominations of the Church of Rome. How did Wycliffe interpret these prophecies, just as the Waldenses did? Here is one of his books, filled with the reference to the Pope as Antichrist. He wrote a special treatise entitled Speculum de Antichristo, the Mirror of Antichrist. From Wycliffe sprang the English Lollards. They numbered hundreds of thousands. What was their testimony? Let me give it to you in the words of one of them. Lord Cobham, that famous man of God who lived just a century before Luther, when brought before King Henry V and admonished to submit himself to the Pope as an obedient child, this was his answer, quote, 
As touching the Pope and his spirituality, I owe them neither suit nor service, for as much as I know him by the scriptures to be the great Antichrist, the son of perdition, the open adversary of God, and an abomination standing in the holy place, end quote. But Antichrist is not supposed to be revealed till after the rapture. That's what it's taught today. Remaining firm in his rejection of Romish error and refusal to bow down to the papacy, Lord Cobham was condemned to death as a heretic. John Fox tells us that on the day appointed for his death in the year 1417, Lord Cobham was brought out of the Tower of London with his arms bound behind him, having a very cheerful countenance, then he was laid upon a hurdle, and so drawn forth into St. Giles Fields, where they had set up a new pail of gallows. As he was coming to the place of execution and was taken from the hurdle, he fell down devoutly upon his knees, desiring Almighty God to forgive his enemies. Then stood he up and beheld the multitude, exhorting them in the most godly manner to follow the laws of God written in the scriptures, and in any wise to beware of such teachers as they see contrary to Christ in their conversation and living. With many other special counsels, then he was hanged up there by the middle, in chains of iron, and so consumed alive in the fire, praising the name of God as long as his life lasted, while he was burning. Are these men supposed to be taken in vain? Uh, I mean... I understand there might be those that um, will profess, which is true, that a lot of the reformers took with them some of the baggage from Rome, okay? Basically, they took some of their traditions with them, which is why, let's just kind of use the phrase DNA. You can find some of, you can find the DNA of the Roman Catholic Church within these Protestant denominations. But these are men who were never a part of the Roman church to begin with. And this is what they said. This is what they believed. So let me read this last portion here. <clears throat> then stood he up and beheld the multitude, exhorting them in most godly manner to follow the laws of God written in the scriptures and in any wise to beware of such teachers as they see contrary to Christ in their conversation and living. With many other special counsels, then he was hanged up there by the middle, in chains of iron, and so consumed alive in the fire, praising the name of God as long as his life lasted. In other words, he was roasted to death. Okay? You know, you know how... People get together and they have a pig roast and they turn, you know, they have the pig on the, the whole iron stick there and they turn them and they turn them and they turn them. And you got a slow roasting fire underneath. That was exactly what he suffered. He was basically cooked, slowly roasted to death. They were burned. Burned, these blessed men of God. Huss was burned. Jerome was burned. Lord Cobham was burned. Even Wycliffe's bones were dug up. 41 years after his death and burned. Savonarola, who preached with trumpet tongue that Rome was Babylon, was burned. All these was burned before the Reformation and thousands more. They were burned, but their words were not burned. Their testimony was not burned. It lived on. Fire could not scorch it. Chains could not bind it. Gags could not silence it. Gowls could not stifle it, swords could not slay it, naught could destroy it. Truth is immortal, truth is unconquerable. Imprison it and it comes forth free. Bury it and it rises again. Crush it to the earth and it springs up victorious, purer for the conflict, nobler for the victory. This is why there are those that are bringing this stuff back up to light. Because this is truth that has been long forgotten.
It may not seem like it to those that that are being surrounded with this information. But don't think of yourselves. Think of those that are outside of this. Think of those that have not even heard this. Think of those of, the, of this history that has been kept from them. Think of those that are being deceived. Don't think of yourselves. Don't think of yourselves as, oh, well, I already, we already know about this. It's not about you. The thing is, 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 is there are people out here trying to rekindle a truth that has been so dampened with leaven and error in the realms of futurism and dispensationalism and rapture doctrine that people turn a blind eye. They might make reference of something here and there during this, you know, regarding this time, but they don't really throw themselves into it okay they don't really think of what they thought they just look at it like oh yeah this is what they believe but anyways yeah uh speaking of the rapture um you know they 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 don't care and it's those people that are deceiving the flocks today The truth to which these confessors witnessed sprang up again a century later and rolled over Europe the tremendous tide of the Reformation. And whence came this testimony which no power could repress? Whence came this testimony trumpet-tongued that Rome in all its myriad-handed might was impotent to silence or arrest? Whence came it? But from that sacred volume written gloomy prisons and lands of captivity and scenes of exile for the guidance, the preservation, the support of God's suffering saints and faith and faithful witnesses in every age. Daniel, the captive, Paul, the prisoner, John, the exile, such were its inspired authors, men whose piercing vision looked down the, the long vista of the church's conflicts, marked her martyrdoms and saw her triumph from afar. O oh, word of divinely given prophecy, O oh, wondrous volume, whose seven seals the Lamb has loosed and opened to meet the moral and spiritual needs of the suffering church he loves so well. How, how have thy solemn utterances, thy mysteries, mysterious symbols, been scanned and studied by earnest, saintly eyes? How hast thou been pondered in prisons, remembered on racks, repeated in the flames? Thy texts are windows through which the light shines from the third heaven down into the darkest depths of earth's conflicts, mysteries, and woes. O sacred and sanctifying truth, how have thy words been watered with the tears of suffering saints steeped in their griefs and sorrows and dyed in the copious streaming of their blood? Precious are the lives which have sealed thee. Precious the truth whose those lives have sealed. Thy words have been wings by which the persecuted church has soared from the wilderness and the battlefield into the pure serene of everlasting love and peace. Like a bright angel, thou art heaven descended and leadest to the skies. By thee has God guided to their glorious consummation the noble army of saints, confessors, martyrs, shining run round his throne like the everlasting stars. And if you want to believe in a rapture, so believe in it. But I guarantee you that these people who have suffered and those that are going to suffer in a so-called seven-year tribulation is what you futurists and rapturists want to put it, they will have a greater reward than you will if you believe in the so-called lie of a pre-tribulation rapture or rapture for that general. Those saints that will be suffering on this earth while you are so-called caught up out of here will have the greater reward than you will receive because you are too weak-minded and you don't want to face what's coming to you. You're weak. You believe lies. And you refuse to come out of it. You refuse to look at the other side. You refuse to think about what was believed then unanimously by the church you claim to be a part of
They are gone into the world of glory forever gone, but the light which led them there remains behind. We cannot touch them. They have vanished from the sight of men like the prophet whose chariot to heaven was a winged flame. We cannot hear the, mus the music of their harpings or the thunder of their song. But we still grasp the book they loved, which made them all they were, and all they are. Ye Waldenses from the lonely blood-stained Alps, ye nameless victims of the dreadful Inquisition, ye noble Protestants before the Reformation, Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, Cobham, Savonarola, we possess the holy pages which ye pondered, the words of truth and life ye sealed with martyred blood. By those words to us, what they were to you. Be those words to us what they were to you. Let them be our inspiration and our testimony and the testimony of our children after us. Till the hour when truth emancipated from all trammels shall shine through the world. And its unclouded splendor and error and superstition and falsehood from its presence shall forever flee away. That is the end of Lecture 5. And, uh, if you have not read this book, I, I suggest reading it. And really ponder the, the, uh, what's written in these pages. Because, uh, what's written in these pages is... What, what was unanimously believed regarding the timing of prophecy, the timing of Antichrist. And when you search it out with Scripture, you can find no other conclusion than to pinpoint the Antichrist as that chair in the Vatican called the papacy and the Pope as its head, the Pope, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the lawless one. who sits in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Doesn't necessarily have to say it in word. All he has to do is say it in action. And what was believed then is no excuse to why we cannot believe it today. The history is out there, folks. It has not been removed. It has not been... I should, I should, it, it, it has not been tampered with. Let's just say that. It's just history has been removed. History that could open up a lot of minds to the aspect of the lies that they are believing and living in. And... Uh, all you got to do is search it out. You hear a lot of people say, do your own research. And boy, that saying is true. Because unless you look this stuff up yourselves, if you're going to rely on somebody reading this stuff to you or teaching you these things, and if you're just going to rely on them, you're not going to come to any knowledge of any truth except for what's being told you. You have to go and you have to look this stuff up yourselves. And you have to become aware. We're... We're giving you, basically, the spots where to look. And instead of passing judgment on, on, on sources we might give or whatever, look at the history that is being documented. Study that history that is being documented. And you come to your conclusions. And I guarantee you, and, 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 I, and it will be unanimous of what the conclusion will be. That the papal power in the Bible is labeled as the Antichrist. And there is no other. There is not, I mean, there is a final pope. Yeah, there will be a final pope, of course. But he will be just as much as the Antichrist as all the other ones have been the Antichrist. <laughs> it's just that simple. And either you're going to come to grips with that. Or you're going to remain in this delusion. 
And regardless of what some will say, this delusion really started in Henry Grattan Guinness's time, maybe a little bit before. There have been little hints and seeds planted, obviously, throughout the centuries, but just because a doctrine is old or just because there has been little seeds planted doesn't mean that those doctrines are true. But what is very unique is that throughout the centuries, from apostolic times all the way up to just maybe a hundred years prior to Martin Luther, okay, and also the Reformation included, they were all unanimous of what Daniel chapter 7 was about, of what Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians regarding the restrainer, and what St. John and the Isle of Patmos wrote in his visions of the apocalypse regarding the beast, that all of these things, all of them apply to the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the Judas priest, the little horn, the historical, biblical, and prophetic Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. It can be no one else. Scripture will not allow it. If I may be so bold to declare it so. Scripture will not allow it. I mean it's it's too it's too obvious to the mind. Once once you look at it and once you look into the scope of history and once you compare that history with the light of scripture in Daniel and in Paul's writings and in, uh, to to the Thessalonians to John's writings in 1 John, 2 John, the book of Revelation it becomes all too obvious that again the Pope of Rome is the Antichrist and its church is the mother of Babylon is the, is, is the scarlet harlot some people might want to say well no Jerusalem is well you could make a case for that but at the same time you also got to look at the scope of history in that sense who do the Jews pay homage to? They pay homage to Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. And who takes upon themselves the, the title of Caesar's today? The papacy. Has, has their allegiance changed? I don't think so. Now, also at the same time, you also got to take into effect Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. Okay. Jerusalem's judgment was done at 70 AD. It was done. So how can a Jerusalem which was destroyed, not one stone was left upon another, be the harlot of Babylon today? Or post-70 AD? Something to think about. If you don't know much about 70 AD, Go check out my Monarchy of Israel series, and I go into very, very grave detail of what happened in 70 AD, that there cannot be without a shadow of a doubt that even Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, is a scope of history from the time of Jesus through the 70 AD and also portrays future events like earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars and these types of things and famines and pestilences. Folks, all this stuff is happening in the now and it's happening around you. But yet when it comes to certain criteria, you refuse to acknowledge it because you want to believe in a system of doctrine that is going to save your butt. Folks, when Jesus says, take up the cross and follow me, what is the cross? What was the cross? It was a death sentence. Okay? It was a death sentence. It was an instrument of torture. It was an instrument of humiliation. 
It was an instrument of persecution. If we are the body of Christ, and we are in Christ, we will suffer persecution. It's a given fact. There are those that will be protected, okay? And there are those that will endure to the end. And yes, we are to pray that we are counted worthy to escape all these things, not a physical removal from the earth. Um, you know, what, do you not believe that God is able to protect you through the most trying times that is to come? And are you not prepared to die a martyr's death if that is his will? Because you're too caught up in a rapture mindset? You're too caught up in a escapist mindset? You just want to save your butt? God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a love, power, and of a sound mind. Okay? <clears throat> and even though we may... <laughs> Even though that they may kill the body. What is to come. Afterwards. Is far more glorious than. This life can ever have. And. When you think about those things alone. Why are you worried about how you're going to be out of How you're going to be taken out of here. What you should be thinking about is where you are going to be on Resurrection Day. Where you are going to be on Resurrection Day. And with that, I'll close. <clears throat> so again, I hope this has been a helpful tool. Romanism and the Reformation, Lecture 5. Um... I will provide the link to where you can read this entire book online. There's also places where you can purchase this book. Um, I think it's a highly recommended read. And um, just as you can tell from the one lecture I read, that um, his these words really cut to the heart. And uh, I think you should let it cut your heart too. For those that want to remain ignorant and that refuse to see the lie that you have been involved with and it hurts I understand it hurts truth sometimes is not a pleasant thing but sometimes we have to do things and sometimes we have to come to terms with things that aren't pleasant Even if it means being brought up in a system of religion all your life, just to find out recently that you have been taught a lie from the very beginning. You know, we have to make that choice and we have to come out of it. And that's really all I have to say. Truth be told, truth be known, stay safe. God bless. See you next time. Bye-bye. Represent the triumphs of the primitive church. He expounds the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13 as a pseudo-Christian false prophet. This, is what the, this was at the end of the 7th century now. Okay, let me repeat that one. He expounds the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13 as a pseudo-Christian false prophet. That's very interesting, especially when we come to the aspect of the United States. <clears throat> Ambrose Alspert wrote a, wrote a copyist commentary on the apocalypse in the middle of the 8th century. He expounds the second beast of Revelation 13 as meaning the preachers and ministers of Antichrist and teaches that Antichrist will be Pro Christo, 
or in Christ's place. It is a remarkable fact that he expounds a grievous sore or ulcer poured out under the first vial as meaning infidelity. This is the general view at the present day among historical interpreters. They consider the infidelity of the French Revolution to be the fulfillment of this vial. Hamel numerous documentations within this lecture that the early church were historicists in historicists in writing <clears throat> that they didn't agree to the doctrine of futurism regarding a one man antichrist that's going to come to power in the last three and a half years of this history of earth's history um, also what that does is also it, it denotes the rapture because without the rapture there is no Antichrist, because the rapture has to happen, and then the Antichrist will arise. So what we did in section one of lecture five is we went through what the early church fathers in apostolic times taught. Again, again, we're going through all of the centuries, brief overview of all the centuries prior to the Reformation, because again, we know what the Reformers believed. They were all unanimous in declaring that the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, has been revealed, and is being revealed, and will be revealed, extending between the fall of the Western Empire of Rome and the development of the Papal Theocracy in the 11th century under Gregory VII. The interpreters of this period belonged, like the fathers, to the historic school. Okay, they were historicists. They did not believe in this futurist uh, doctrine. They interpreted the apocalypse as a prophecy of the whole course of events from the first advent to the consummation, meaning the second coming of Christ. The following authors living in this interval wrote commentaries on the entire apocalypse. Primacius, the Venerable Bede, Alspert, Hamo, Andreas, Erythrus, and Berengad. Primacius, who lived in the middle of the 6th century, interpreted the 144,000 sealed persons in the Apocalypse as the Christian Church. He held that Antichrist would substitute himself for Christ and, blasphem and blasphemously assume his dignity, and that the Seven Hill City was Rome. The Venerable Bede, who lived in the north of England at the close of the 7th century, was an historical interpreter of the Apocalypse. Here is a copy of his commentary. He takes the first seal to, um, as the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. Okay. Um, and, uh, and obviously through uh, the last 150 years there has been a change of emphasis of that uh, basically to the point where, you know, the Antichrist is no longer the papacy. It's someone that's going to come in the future you know so and so therefore the churches today no longer believe that um, the doctrines that um, founded their faith today which is the reformation the doctrines from the reformation and stuff like that which again was unanimously agreed upon so we're going to um, read in section two, starting at the very end of page 202. <clears throat> and it goes as follows, states as follows. Uh, number two, we come now in the second place, very briefly to review the history of prophetic interpretation in the interval Greetings, friends. I want to welcome you to part two of the Futurist Dispensational Delusion. And in part one, we, uh, well, actually, the whole series of videos 
in context of this is dealing with um, the Protestant reformer Henry Gretton Guinness in his book Romanism and the Reformation. We are specifically reading Lecture 5. And in Lecture 5, <clears throat> what uh, what is basically discussed about is the um, historical evidence of the church um, and their standpoint of prophecy regarding the Antichrist and also regarding the distinction between futurism and historicism. Henry Grattan Guinness makes the claim, and obviously through 